What's up, you guys? Welcome back to The Link, Lauren Position, where I give my position on pop culture, politics, news, relationships, whatever the hell I want to talk about. So a few days ago, I sat down with Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss for a full in-depth conversation about Bitcoin, rowing in the Olympics, mental health, therapy, trauma. I think we trauma bonded. I don't even know what happened. We also talked about their new band, which I saw a few weeks ago in Brooklyn. It really was such an amazing conversation. It was such a privilege to have them. They dropped so many kernels of knowledge along the way. So get a pen and a pad, pour yourselves a drink, sit down, buckle up, because here are Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss. But one last thing, one last thing before I bring the twins out. I'm about to bring the twins out, you guys. I just have to say, this is the first time I'm throwing the episode up on YouTube. A lot of you have DM me and said we want the visual aspect. We want to see the twins if the twins are coming on. So you can go to YouTube and watch it. I know thousands of you listen to the podcast on Spotify. Shout out to Spotify for pushing it out to new people. They've been amazing. You guys are amazing. But if you want to see the twins, this is the first time I'm putting an episode up on YouTube. So without further ado, here are Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss. Should we do an interview? You guys want to just change your backgrounds 10 times. Cameron's gone, I think. Cameron's I'm, I'm just back. like, I'm, I'm peace out. I was just trying okay. to... I'm pretending I'm in the Gemini office right now. <laughs> okay, so let's just start by talking about the band. Hold on, one of your 15 assistants is texting me. Let me know if Tyler doesn't <laughs> join. Thank you. Okay, wait, let me tell her. Who is this, Courtney? I'm going to say they're here. It's all good. <laughs> um... Yeah, I was like, it'd be easier to set up a meeting with the Pentagon than you guys. But um, yeah, let's talk about the band. So I want to know what made you guys want to start a band during the pandemic? Was it like, okay, we have fuck you money and we're just going to start a band? Or you guys always have been passionate about music? The latter. Um, so we grew, <laughs> we, we, grew up, uh, we grew up playing uh, <laughs> piano and I think played through high school. So about 12 years as kids growing up. So I guess we've sort of been around music or playing instruments for a while. And then in, uh, in, in college, I uh, picked up the acoustic guitar, but we've been kind of attracted to the instrument and enjoyed it. And my freshman year roommate was amazing. So I learned a few things and kind of messed around and then let go of it for a while. And then started getting into the electric guitar the past uh, couple of years. And uh, long story short, we started jamming together during COVID. And we're like, hey, we should just go do this. Um, we felt like, let's just make this dream a reality. And, right. uh, and here we are. I was so excited to come to the concert. I have to be honest, my bar was like low. I'm like, I don't know what this is going to be. I invited like five of my friends and they thought I was kidding. I was like, so the Winklevoss twins are in a rock cover band and they're playing a show in Brooklyn. And my friends are like, fuck off. This is like an SNL sketch. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so then I went and it was actually so goddamn good. I think because you guys were playing cover songs and everyone was happy to be back out and just having a good time. The concert was so much fun. I ended up becoming friends with this girl from the concert. I didn't know her. She messaged me on Instagram and she said hey we met at the concert and I said we did she's like yeah we were next to each other you had such good vibes so now we're friends and I told her I said I'm having the Winklevoss twins on do you have any questions so she wants to know where you guys got the leather pants from that you were wearing on stage oh <laughs> uh those were from John Varvatos oh okay okay uh, I was like are they from were... All Saints Saint Laurent they're from John Varvatos did you buy them or did someone pick them out no we bought them um, oh my god we got uh <laughs> We got um, rock star outfits. It's a really cool store on the Bowery, which used to be a very cool sort of punk rock club. Mm -hmm. so it was CBGBs. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. So I think they're technically, are they wax jeans, but they look they look Lovely. leather because if they were leather, they'd probably be so hot. You guys like on stage, like we were hot. So I can't imagine you guys were probably so hot. I was saying, I was like, you guys should auction them off as an NFT or something. And people would probably <laughs> buy them. Were there songs that didn't make the cut that you guys decided not to perform? We have like, we've played around with probably 10 other songs that will eventually make it into the set or some of them will. Okay. And we've got a really, so, like a medley of some reggae songs and a lot of fun material. Really? But reggae songs? Yeah. yeah, like a little Bob Marley, some police, um, and, and things like that. Um, oh, if you guys did so, like message in a bottle, that'd be so good. It might make it into a future so set. So I, I have some songs that I just wanted to throw out there, right? Because I'm right, thinking, okay, crowd pleasers, you want to do some good covers. So I was thinking like living on a prayer because everybody mm -hmm. loves that song you guys are gonna think these are super corny but like 
Living on a Prayer is like the national anthem of New Jersey, and you know, people would love that. You could play Take On Me, love that song, Tainted Love. I was thinking also I Write Sins, Not Tragedies by Panic at the Disco. It's not so much like 90s, early 2000s. Then I thought Anything by Fall Out Boy. Um, and then maybe like Photograph by Nickelback because everybody like hates but loves that song. And it would just be yeah, like, right, right. like that would be like viral, like the fucking Delta variant. Like people we would recently, love that shit. Yeah, we recently, yeah, we, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. If you have no, more go ahead. I was saying we uh, recently watched the uh, Woodstock 99 documentary. And it just brought me back to like all those, uh, like I guess Nickelback. He isn't. He probably performed there. He's not in there, but like Chad Creed Kroger. and all those those guys. And <laughs> in uh, in the late '90s, it took us back. But um, those are great, it, great suggestions. No, I was just thinking like songs that's like they might not even be your favorite songs. I'm just like crowd pleasers that people don't even remember that they want, but when they come to the show, they want. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, right. Did you guys have like a pre-show drink or like were you taking shots? Was there a pre-show ritual? Was there like what were you doing? Just like we did a sound it check. Rock and roll. Yeah. What? what? Yeah. It was <laughs> not that rock and roll. Okay, okay. No, I didn't think it would be. I mean, you guys are, like, used to getting ready for, like, the Olympics and stuff. So I'm like, maybe they're not having a pre-show drink. Um, I have enough okay. time playing sober, so I feel like if I had a bunch of shots, it would be really Are you really guys, okay. So, Cameron, you're probably taking guitar lessons. Tyler, you're probably taking voice lessons. Or what's going on? Correct. That's I actually right. never sang until about six months ago. Okay. Uh, I'm so, shocked. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, just never did it. Never me did me it. too. Yeah. I, I'm shocked as well. <laughs> never did the, uh, the plays growing up or whatnot. And I actually started on keys in, in the band, but I kind of felt like I wasn't challenging myself enough. And if you're going to do this, you got to YOLO do it, right? Yeah. And it would be weird also, like if people came to see Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss and you guys were kind of like in the background, like you got to sing. And also yeah. people, aren't co people aren't coming to see you because you're like paparazzi. They're coming to have a good time and like hear songs that they love. So don't even worry about it. You know what I'm saying? Right. So when um, we started thinking about that, it was kind of like, yeah, you're, it's a good point. It's sort of like, if I'm not up there, like what's the point? of doing this and so right. um i sort of decided to go full send i actually got a voice coach who teaches rock and roll and voice at nyu uh, okay really cool that's guy. where i just graduated from okay cool so, yeah. you know kurt robinson yeah of course sounds okay. familiar yeah He's coach um so he so i started working with him got the technique and um sort of uh worked on the the stagecraft as well right and he gave me the confidence to be like, hey, I can, I can, I can do this. I don't totally sound like crap. Yeah. Uh, so we started working together <laughs> with my voice and, um, and then also the stage crap. And I said, yeah. uh, let's go, let's kind of go do this. Cause otherwise, like, what's the point, you know, if right. On like, put yourself out there. It's sort of like, um, take, taking a risk and doing something that's unpredictable for you and for other people. Some people like, they learn stand-up comedy or they do some improv acting. And I mm -hmm. guess this is sort of my version of, of challenging myself in a way that is like totally new because um, I don't know if we mentioned earlier in the call, we grew up playing classical piano for most of our life. Right. Well, I was like watching all of your past podcasts and interviews. <laughs> I watched way too many. I could probably do your like, you know, elevator pitches. Like right, it's right. a store. Yeah, it's a store of value. But um in every Zoom, you have this like nice piano in the background. So I was going to ask you what sheet music you had up on the piano. So I, so we, so we, we uh, grew up playing. I can't, I can't with this background. This yeah, with the background, <laughs> I can't get it. Uh, but I have um, some. So I played some Scott Joplin. Okay, uh, okay. Um, but I can't actually, see it, but. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, Chopin, Beethoven were okay. my favorite. Back in the day, so a lot of classical stuff, super technical, and a lot of fun. But but our teacher was very old school; it was only classical. And there was this oh. concert every a festival every March, so you'd get graded with these judges. You'd have to have the piece memorized, and you'd hand them the sheet music. You'd go up and play, memorizing in this auditorium. I mean, talk about completely. My God. Tracking. Um, but we did that from like the age we could count till about high school, went to college, didn't keep it up. And then I, Cameron started getting into, he self-taught himself guitar in college, but when we were rowing for the Olympics, we didn't have much time to 
pursue other passions. Anyway, fast forward <laughs> to done with rowing, back in the city or in the city, Cameron got a guitar teacher, started uh, working on electrical guitar for a year or so. I asked his teacher, hey, do you have any piano teachers? I started getting back into, into piano, but more from like a pop angle. Right. I never really grew up playing pop. And then, um, and then we sort of, the band started happening. Um, and so that's why I started on, on keys. But our background is classical uh, piano. And I, I, I really, I do love it because it's challenging. It's super beautiful. Obviously, you can play it by yourself. But, um, but maybe one day I will add some keys and singing. That's what I used to do. I took my piano lessons on campus. And so we would get graded and have recitals and things like that. But after like a year or two, my teacher was like, you're not feeling classical music. So I would do like Michael Buble and sort of piano yeah. and sing and Bruno Mars and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it's just way more fun. But let me tell you, being the singer is so much easier than doing keys or like other. You should just stay the singer <laughs> because number one, you don't have to break anything down, carry anything with you. Like you don't want to be the drummer who has to like pack up all this shit. At, no, you should just stay. I know. Singer. It's just literally this mic and this one stand and boom. Yeah, for sure. Did you guys play any private shows beforehand to sort of like warm up? Yeah, we did a few. Um, in June, we did a uh, <clears throat> private show at my my uh, home, and then we did a few like dress rehearsals leading up to that to kind of get comfortable because we had never played uh, in front of people before. I can't imagine. Uh, I can't yeah. imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. a totally different skill, and you don't know like you can get comfortable. Like for me, at least as a singer, even singing with just the band at first is like awkward and a little bit intimidating right. and you have a, your ego, you know, you got to kill your ego and just get comfortable to it. Oh, for sure. And so we did a good job of like trickling and, and then a few people, a few strangers and a few friends and sort of like we did two mini dress rehearsals to kind of get those nerves up and see like how you're going to do because I don't think your first performance you, you want to do like the first time you're in front of the people, like in front of people, like the big show. So we sort of like escalated that a bit and got right. more comfortable. So I guess like technically the knitting factory, we had like two dress rehearsals and then kind of like a private show um, at Cameron's apartment. Mm -hmm. And then we went to the knitting factory. So we sort of like stepped up to that. Um, which was great because when we got there, we sort of had a sense of like how it might go. For sure. Also, like I always remind myself when I perform, like everyone wants to see you do well and have a good time. Like no one wants you to fuck up or fail. Everybody's literally there to have a good time. And you know what I'm saying? So just yeah, remind yeah. yourself Every that. People are on your side, right? Like you're, yeah. you're it, it's not a performance. Like you're there to play and have fun. It's not and one like of your recitals. You're not really being it, judged. Like It's so easy to like get into your head and be like, oh, I've got to be perfect or I've got, I can't make mistakes or whatever. But like really the, the goal is like if you look out and people are smiling and having a good time, like mission accomplished, right? That's, That's what I was saying. The all energy, that matters. The energy was so good. That's what I was talking about on my Instagram the next day. I was like, the energy was so positive coming out of covid like i go to a, a lot of shows at least before covid and i was like what's the energy what's the vibe gonna be like everybody was there to have a good time it was a fucking motley crew of just random people every age group shape size color gender like everybody was just there having a good time because you guys are playing like nirvana blink 182 stuff like that it's funny because like after the first um, a couple of like, so the, the first private show and then the knitting factory, right. some of the feedback I got was like, oh, that time when you like kind of lost a line and ad libbed it was like the best part of the show. Yeah. You so, literally like, know like, kind of like fucking up is like <laughs> sometimes the best part. And that was kind of a lesson I learned. It's like, yeah, you're right. People are on your side. And like, it's not like, even though we all kind of grew up in these like recital test environments mm -hmm. that's kind of like the educational system for sure in, in like you know the world especially in like classical music um it's not a recital you know it's just performance it's just like group tribal thing and i try and remind myself of that that like people are on your side and this is just like group thing that's very human and it's like tribal and just to like lean into it and really have fun 
Yeah, and also, like, if you mess up, what's that thing? It's called, like, the spotlight effect. Like, you think it's a much bigger deal than everybody else does. Like, literally right. no one gives yeah. a shit, Tyler. I'm telling <laughs> you. Like, if you mess up, no one cares. And they probably didn't even notice. Like, they had right, no, exactly. Like, they didn't and it's notice. Like, also, I feel like... If you guys were amazing at another thing, people are like, oh my God, they've been in the Olympics. They invented Facebook. They're fucking Bitcoin billionaires. Like, oh my God, they're not amazing, whatever. Who cares? Everybody's yeah, there to have exactly. a good time, you know? And then I was even saying the next day, what I love so much about it is like, I love, especially in 2021, and I see this more every year, I love when people step out of what they're supposed to do or they're not tied down by perception. Because so many people go through life and think, well, I could try this, but that's not really my wheelhouse. So this isn't my lane. Let me stay in my lane. And I'm like, fuck the lane. There is no lane. Do what you want. It's the wild, wild west. And so that's what was so awesome. It's like, no one would expect you guys to start a rock band. And then it worked and was so much fun. Yeah, no, it just bugs me sometimes when I see people be like, oh, I'm not, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do that. It's like, the people I look up to do everything or at least try it all yeah it's it's totally bullshit like we're we're multi-variable human beings you know there's right. so many different sides of us but society like indoctrinates us you have to be this on this track like you are a lawyer you are an entrepreneur you are mm -hmm. an artist and like ultimately there's a part of all of us that are creative and art sure. and it's sort of like um the fun part about this whole band and experiment is we've like i've certainly discovered parts of myself that I didn't even know was there, like singing, being a front man, mm -hmm. and sort of cultivating that garden that was already right. there. And it was really gratifying to talk to people after the show. They're like, hey, this has inspired me to go do that thing I've always been kind of thinking or dreaming about to do on the side or a passion. Mm -hmm. And I see you up there and like, I have no excuse now. I'm gonna go do that. And I think like we have like all of these different sides of us for that sure. because of life gets in the way or whatever, we don't end up like going to it or procrastinating. And and we're sort of guilty as charged, you know, like mm -hmm. we probably could have started this band five years ago and, you know, got, got more into it, whatever. But we're here and we're doing it. And it's <clears throat> really been a lot of fun. It's taught me a lot about myself in ways I didn't know I could do that. But it's right. also really contagious, too. Were you more nervous doing the band or more nervous going out in front of like the Bitcoin conference in Miami? Like you probably aren't that nervous going out in front of those people, right? You're not singing. You're just there to talk about Bitcoin. Well, what was like, unique about Bitcoin 2021 is I don't think we've been around that many people in like 18 months. So exactly. it was like, whoa, this, this, your, your like nervous system is like trying to process all this energy, but it was actually really positive and fun. Um, but I guess like the, the music thing, I mean, I guess like, in one way, the expectations, I guess, could be kind of low, right? Nobody really knows what to expect in one way. Um, but it's definitely like, I think even the most seasoned performers tend to get like pretty amped as they're getting on stage, unless they're like doing show 100 in the tour, in which case they're just like trying to keep it interesting. Because right. they're probably so bored of like playing the same set list. But I'd say maybe it's a little different in, in one way, but at the same time, like, even when we go on stage in like Bitcoin conferences, we're just trying to have fun. We're just trying to tell our story. Exactly. It's all about fun. And like most of the people in the crowd are there, they're, they own Bitcoin, they're hodlers, they're kind of there with you, right? And they, they're all rooting, you know, for you. Um, so, so there's like, there's similarities, but I guess like, you know, we've never played in front of people before. So that was like new and unique. But to Tyler's point, like um, going back, like, I mean, I feel like we procrastinated on the band thing for years. I mean, to, to Tyler's point, like we probably could have done this five years ago. And Chris, our drummer, actually like tricked me into getting into a studio about two years ago with Mike, the other guitarist. He's like, Mike was like, hey, come come meet me. Um, let's do a lesson in the studio. I have free studio time. So I showed up and Chris was on drums. And I'm like, what are you doing here, Chris? And he's like, uh, we're jamming. Let's go. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and, and, and then we started going and then I, I pulled in Tyler and then, uh, Tyler pulled in his piano teacher, Christian. Yeah. Um, and it kind of started to snowball from there, but it's sort of, you know, something that I had joked about with Chris for a while and, but didn't act on it, you know, it was sort of and sitting on it. So I think kind of like happened organically and small and kept growing. Right. It wasn't like so overwhelming. We didn't like say, oh, we're going to, you know, be at the knitting factory 
a year from now. It's sort of like... <laughs> well, also, like, we happen. could be on another lockdown a year from now. Like, who the hell knows? Like, we don't even know who the governor could be, like, a year from now. Like, everything is right, changing. Right. No one knows. Yeah. Also, like, a little bit of a different muscle than public speaking because, like, in one way, if I'm public speaking, I'm being myself. But as the front man, it's like me but it's a different me you know it's like tyler like, 2.0 <laughs> yeah like there's like an exoskeleton so like maybe it's it's like a, a character thing you know a little For bit sure. like a different character so it's a little bit different like the nerves are different and i think the key is like talking yourself like hey this is fun there's no fear here there's really no downside this is just like have fun it's easier said than done you know right because we're all like at the end of the day we're perfectionists and we're our own worst critics. Like mm -hmm. we're so much harder on ourselves than like anyone else. For if sure. someone talked to you like the way you talk to yourself, you'd punch them out. No, for sure. Yeah. Like I'm so much harder you on myself get than other people. That's why I always have to remind myself, literally no one cares that much about you. Like I have to remind myself, like no one actually cares that much. So just do what you want because life is so What do short. they say in your, in your 20s? Like you're upset because nobody's paying attention to you. In your 30s, you think like people are – uh, spending too no, no, much no, attention no, on you. I'm going to correct you. In the Sorry, 20s, yeah, go for it. <laughs> I got it wrong. I screwed up. In the 20s, um, you think everyone's paying attention to you. At 40, you don't even care. At 60, you realize no one was paying attention to you. They're worried right. about themselves. Have your parents seen the band? Are they supportive of it? Or are you not going to let them come see it yet? They haven't seen it yet. They're totally supportive. And they're like, when can we see the video and the tape and whatever? Um, <laughs> so they're going to probably come yes. to the next show. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I'll meet them at the next show. I'll be like, hi, how are you? Um, would you guys ever do a concert in like Fortnite or in the metaverse? Because I feel like Travis mm. Scott, we talked about this even in my classes last year, like Travis Scott's like multi-million dollar deal with Fortnite. Ariana Grande just did a show. Maybe you guys got to do something in some form of the metaverse at some point. So that's a great question because we're actually uh, thinking about doing that this fall in uh, one of the world's, uh, I think, Somnium. Somnium space? Yep. And uh, so we might do, yeah, I think it's, uh, we're definitely going to do that, even if we can't tour, if like, you know, Delta keeps climbing or whatever. I know, I can't keep up. It's like Delta, Delta Plus, Lambda, Epsilon. I'm like, Lambda. I literally, I literally can't keep up with all the variants. I'm like, and now they're saying we need a third shot. And I'm like, I can't, I'm done. I'm really done. I got yeah. the two shots and I've like, I'm had it. I can't do a booster, please. I remember when it was like- You're gonna need to. Just, just <laughs> lock down for eight weeks and we'll be through this, flatten the curve. <laughs> no, what's so funny is it's like March, 2020 classes went online, they went on Zoom and they're like, we're gonna come back April 19th of 2020. And I was like, okay, I'll come back, whatever. I thought I was just going home for like an extended spring break. They never came the fuck back. I graduated on Zoom. I never saw anybody again. I was like, what does every other like obnoxious bitch do during the pandemic just start a podcast you know what i'm saying um but yeah no that would be sick if you guys did a concert in vr okay you're sending the link to somnium space okay and this I is a erc20 token um called cube that we actually trade on gemini so if you're curious to check it out for sure we got it we're gonna get to gemini and bitcoin all right so maybe we should just transition to talking about gemini <laughs> because also i've seen other podcasts where people hold you hostage for two hours and then they mention gemini and bitcoin like the last one minute and you guys are sitting there like being verbally waterboarded and so let's just go ahead and talk about bitcoin and gemini because that's sort of how i started messaging cameron and sort of blowing up his instagram dms i was like what do I do? What should I buy? And you were like, do Bitcoin and Ether. And this was in December, which I think was actually a really good time to get into crypto because then things went like this. December 20, uh, of, this of year. 2020. Yeah, this last this Christmas. Year, yeah. yeah. And I think so yeah. many people were sitting at home, like that's sort of around, the, I think around the holidays, it was like GameStop, AMC, everyone is getting, you know, into yep. crypto. They're like, let me take this stimulus and get into crypto or get into, you know, whatever. And so I got to be so real with you guys. I don't have any Bitcoin, but I'm really into Ether. It's my favorite. Okay. All I do is like buy more Ether. Like my prayer is like Ether will just like drop below 2000 again, like it was a few weeks ago. And then I just like get more. Um, and so I'm sort of like betting on Ether just because like, as a creative person, my understanding of what Ether is. And you guys can explain also for the people who are going to hear this, you can explain sort of what Ether and Bitcoin are. 
but I'm just am so much more passionate about Ether than I am Bitcoin. And then the other coin I'm obsessed with is Maker Coin. I don't know if you guys are really into Maker Coin, but it sort of like travels kind of like Ether. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, we love Ethereum as well. We're big toddlers in Ether and Bitcoin. And, and I guess for some people, like Bitcoin's easier to understand as like digital gold. Right. Um, and if you look at the market cap of gold, I think it's like nine trillion dollars. So if you look mm. at the market cap of Bitcoin and it overtakes gold, you can sort of do the math. And we think it's like a 10x from here at the minimum. And we actually right. wrote a piece um, last summer when Bitcoin was at 13,000 called the case for $500,000 Bitcoin. Right. And so we're up 5x from last summer, but we still got 10x to go before uh, Bitcoin overtakes uh, gold. Mm -hmm. But I think Ethereum is this sort of uh, creative design space, a decentralized operating system, and it's sort of unbounded. Like, how can you put a put a sort of a, a upper bound on the size of this this uh, space where you can just create and build all kinds of decentralized apps and things on top right. of it? So. Given that you're like a more creative person and you gravitate towards ether, that makes actually a lot of sense to me. Um, I think people who like have spent a lot of time, let's say, on Wall Street or in financial markets might gravitate first to Bitcoin because they're like, oh, this is a fixed hard asset. Um, it makes a lot of sense to them. Right, for sure. And like I want people listening to this because... When I started posting about crypto, I would just like make some memes and post about it and be like, oh my God, I'm glad I got in. And so many people, a lot of girls who follow me were messaging me like, what do you use to buy Bitcoin or what do you use for crypto? Like I'm on Robinhood or I'm on Coinbase. I'm like, no, you should just download Gemini. Like it's super clean. It's safe. Like I don't really fuck with Robinhood or any of that. I wouldn't ever go on there. And so I told them, I was like, just download Gemini. So I'm constantly telling people. And my advice, not that I really know much about anything, but my advice is like put some money in and then just like step back for five years, maybe 10 years. I think yeah. a lot of my friends and my generation and people listening to this, they've sort of gotten this warped idea of even the stock market as being like a get rich quick scheme, which it was like never, at least not for us, the little guy was not meant to be like you should put money in and then hodl and just hold it and not watch it you know, every single yeah. day. And I think some people do and they get caught up in like Bitcoin dropped or whatever. It's like, if there's one thing I've learned about crypto, even in the last like nine months, it's always going to come back up. You know, like I'm not a right. financial advisor, but like anytime it's dropped, This is not financial advice. <laughs> this is not financial advice. Yes, actually I'm, you know, starting my own VC and um, whatever. But no, this is not financial advice, but just like step back and stop watching like the daily chart or even the weekly chart. This month has obviously been really good for everything. But no, I think sometimes people think, well, if I put some money into Bitcoin, it's not doubling, tripling, quadrupling overnight. And that wasn't really the point of it. Yeah, no, I think I think like that's all what we sort of say is like buy and hold and, and maybe don't look at it month to month or year to year. If you have trouble sort of watching the, the gyrations of the market, because it is right. a volatile uh, market. But I think it's all about holding that this sort of digital real estate or digital value and nobody really makes money like day trading or trading in and out of things it's just like too hard to time and and nobody can predict the future right um, <laughs> i mean there's like a big there's a big sell-off in march during the the uh, early part of the pandemic i think bitcoin got down to like under four thousand dollars and i think a lot of people sold and it's like you know here we are at forty five thousand dollars so you just have to sort of uh set it and forget it that's really the only strategy to to play these assets just right. like you would want to go if we were talking in the uh if we were in the like the late 90s you'd want to go long google uh, long Amazon and literally hold them for 25 years, not yeah, trade in and out. Jake was not buying them or selling them. So like, okay, I was just looking up some stats on Gemini before this, right? So I went to the year chart. So let's start. All right. So I also looked up the Vanguard S&P 500. So this year, the past 12 months, VOO is up 31%. Okay, cute. Tesla's up 83%. Cute. Apple's up 28%. And then I was like, okay, well, let me look at Ether on Gemini's one-year chart. Ether is up 646%. <laughs> Bitcoin is up right. 286%. In like a week, it could be 300 whatever percent. Maker coin, my favorite coin, for I don't really have any reason, but I just like it and it's green, up 616%. I'm not a financial advisor, but for the people listening to this who I'm telling to go download Gemini and who are interested in Bitcoin, it's like a mistake not to at least put something in because if it's 600%, even if we have like another bad year or whatever, you're probably going to have another year of like 600% after that. So just put something in and like chill 
and be patient. Right. And don't try and time the market. Like just, right. and, and it's one of those things, I think people, they look at, they look at Bitcoin and they're like, oh my gosh, it's at 45,000. I saw it at 10,000. Now it's too expensive or whatever. It's all just right. this mental construct. But, but if you just sort of get in it a little bit and feel it and get comfortable, um, dip your like toe in the water, Right. That's really the way to do it. For sure. I just feel like if you look at the numbers, because I just like to look at data, right? Because I'm like, what do I know? Let me look at the data. So if Ether is literally up 646%, you're playing yourself by not getting in. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. Same with Bitcoin. If you guys think Bitcoin is going to be 500000 a coin, 40000 45000 really isn't that much. And so It's super cheap. Oh, yeah, also, if, people don't realize you don't have to buy. A, a, that's what I was about to say. Let's explain to the people who are going to listen to this. What I realized, and even when I posted it on my story a few days ago, I was having you guys on. I got a lot of responses. A lot of people, they want to get involved in Bitcoin. They want, they're like, how do I get involved? I don't know what this is. It seems like some weird esoteric thing that I'm not a part of. And it's the cool, like, you don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. You could put $10 in and feel it out. And then you're going to get bitten by the bug and start, you know, putting all the money, more money into it. Right, right. And um, explain to people what you don't have to do a whole fucking Bitcoin. You can, yeah, you can download the Gemini app from the App Store or the Android Store. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to onboard within like 90 seconds. And you can literally buy as small as $5 of Bitcoin or Ether and get started there. And if you invite your friends and they buy, I think, up to 100 bucks, you get $10 of Bitcoin in right. your account for free. So it's it, we, we're trying to make it super accessible and easy and, and reduce that sort of like intimidation factor. For sure. um, because there are some so people anybody can like, get in. People are like, do I need to have like storage? Do I need to mine for this? And it's like, right. no, literally download the app and put some in or go to Gemini.com. I sound like I'm doing your promo, which I am. <laughs> yeah, but, you're um, doing a great job, by the way. But I'm just like, download it and put a little bit in. You're playing yourself yeah. by not putting some in. And I understand there is, you know, a, a generational gap as well. I was talking to a friend of mine who's 66 and she was saying, well, I don't know. What if it just disappears and goes away? Like, what if Satoshi Bukaki or whatever his name is just decides I'm taking it all and I'm not doing this anymore? You know, and I think people have that genuine concern where they're like, I don't trust this. It's like some people, they don't want to put their information online anymore or at all. Explain how safe it is to invest in Gemini. You're a New York trust company. I'm still doing your PR. Yeah, um, like but we're, explain we're, to we're people. regulated. <laughs> we're regulated like under New York banking law. So mm -hmm. we're not going to take your money and disappear to Mexico or something and never right. again. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you can download. Well, I was telling my friend, I was like, they don't need your fucking money. You're going to put 20 bucks in. They're it's not, not running off it. with yeah, it. It's not worth I it. I promise you the Winkle gonna, Plus twins are not running off with your money. We're not going to steal your $200 or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but you can download the app. You can add your debit card. There's yeah. an Apple Pay functionality. And it's sort of like a brokerage account where you buy – a share of Apple, you just buy Bitcoin or Ether mm -hmm. um, and it sits in your account. Like that's basically your investment. So let's clear that up too, because some people have said, some critics of Bitcoin, they're like, well, what can I buy with it? And I feel like maybe there's a day where you can really buy stuff with Bitcoin, but I think of Bitcoin as like, you're not buying something with Amazon stock, you're mm -hmm. investing in it and holding it. But people literally mm -hmm. say like, well, can I buy something with Bitcoin? What can I do with Bitcoin? I'm like, just invest in it like you would a traditional stock and just wait and sit on your hands and wait. Right. But people think they need to be able to like buy, you know, a Chipotle bowl with it. And that's just not the case. Yeah, it's so. like a bar of gold, <laughs> a bar of gold, right? You, you, people don't use gold to buy things. It's a store of value investment. Right. Unless you're like um, a hipster living in Williamsburg and you're like, you know, at the organic coffee. Like, <laughs> but right. yeah, you know, people aren't buying things with Bitcoin. Unless you're going um, to like the pawn shop or whatever, you're in Vegas. But <laughs> yeah, like Bitcoin is a store of value. It's a hedge to inflation. Mm -hmm. So like when the Fed prints all this money, the $100 you have is less scarce. So it's losing right. power. So it's better to put that value in something like gold or Bitcoin or maybe an investment like Amazon that actually appreciates. Because if you put cash in your mattress, over time, you're losing a lot of, of value. So that's sure. the appeal to, to Bitcoin. Also, um, we're coming out with the Gemini credit card where you it works like any other credit card. 
um, but you can earn back to 3% in any crypto you choose. So some people are like, how do I invest in Bitcoin? How do I time the market? What amount of money do I put aside of my savings to go in? Um, right. This sort of eliminates all those questions because you just get the Gemini credit card and you spend it, you go about your daily life and routine, swipe your card, and every time you swipe your card, you're earning crypto into right. your uh, Gemini account. So that could be Ether if you choose Ether, it could be Bitcoin, it could be Maker, it could be Cube, whatnot. And it could be Dogecoin, you it could be Dogecoin. Also. <laughs> yeah. So that's in your account, and then we have Gemini Earn. You can put that in Gemini Earn and even mm -hmm. more earn um, more APY on that. So in Doge, I think Doge right now, the APY is like 7%, 7.4% a year. So you can swipe your credit card with the Gemini credit card, earn Doge, and then uh, earn a return on that Doge all inside the, the Gemini universe. And if the Doge goes up in value, then it might be worth <laughs> more than the actually the flat screen TV that you bought in the first place. It's pretty cool. For sure. And something else I think we should talk about, when you buy Bitcoin on Robinhood, isn't it you're not really buying Bitcoin? You're like buying some, like what is the deal with it? It's not like really it's there. Like, I, I joke that it's uh, it's like crypto LARPing because you're, you're not buying the crypto, you're buying exposure to the crypto. Okay. So let's say you buy Bitcoin on Robinhood and you want to withdraw that Bitcoin out. You can't. It's actually jailed. You have to sell it into cash and then wire out the money. And when you okay. sell it into cash, you create a taxable event. Versus Gemini, if you own Bitcoin in Gemini, you can withdraw that Bitcoin to your ledger wallet. You don't have to For sell sure. it into cash. So it's really like a truer, more native crypto experience as opposed to like investment exposure. So just for the people listening, Invest a little bit, download Gemini, get some Bitcoin, get some Ether for my sake, and just wait. Just sit and wait. But you know, we're not good at being patient. We want everything now. We're like, we want the new season of Ozark now. We want this. We want the new season of Selling Sunset now. We want it to go up now. And I'm like, just wait. Chill. It's going to go up. Also, let's talk about Robinhood because you guys were very outspoken during the AMC GameStop situation. I watched a video you guys were on Squawk Box or CNBC, mm -hmm. and the guy was like, but Tyler. How do you know what you're talking about? And you were like, <laughs> this is your show, goddammit. Like, why are you asking me shit? And so a lot of people are upset with this guy, Vlad. What were your thoughts and sentiments during the GameStop situation? What are your thoughts and sentiments now looking back? And how have they changed? Are they basically the same? On the halting of the trading and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, look, Wall Street is not a level playing field. The whole world saw that with GameStop, you know, and the right. fact that you could stop half the side of the trades. The answer really is is crypto. It's a more level playing field. Like there's no, you can't stop the blockchain. You right. know, there's no sort of inside information or baseball there. And so I think ultimately that's where a lot of that energy is going is into crypto because it's a more level playing field. And you can't help but feel like the current system is rigged. Like the clearinghouse called Robin Hood and say, said, stop something. And like, right. we still don't understand like who made the decision at the clearinghouse and the clearinghouse is owned by the banks, mm -hmm. you know, and all the institutional players. And then there was these hearings. Um, With Vlad? Well, this is, <laughs> this is the best part or the worst part. It's all theater because they never invited the clearinghouse Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the the N NSCC, the National Security Clearing Corporation, that actually called Robin Hood. Right. No representative was there to be asked questions or answer questions. So it's sort of like the hitman wasn't brought to the hearing. You know. Right. Like the crime, like the most important player. It was all the witnesses, but not not any of the yeah, not the actual. Or they have like the me put. the messenger and all that, but it's like you need the actual dude. And sometimes the cover right. up it's is as the cover up is worse. Like, person of interest was not at the hearing. I mean, it was just all theater. What's so frustrating about the whole episode that is like nobody like I don't think trading has ever been stopped on a ticker when a hedge fund is like excessively shorting and trying to destroy a business. And I think GameStop has like 15,000 employees trying to run that out of out of business. No mm -hmm. clearinghouse has sort of like halted the downward slope of that stock. And yet 
when the little guys were sort of winning on the other side, it's like, oh no, this is getting out of control. That like people are winning too much. Um, we're just going to like cool this down. And, and I think that it, it, it sort of exposed centralized finance. And quite frankly, like Robinhood is just an extension of that. It's like a better mousetrap. But at the end of the day, it's beholden to all these sort of clearing houses and agents and people that can just sort of shut it down. Whereas if you look at decentralized finance, it's permissionless. There's no sort of gatekeeper or people that can uh, do that. Right. And I also want to say for the people listening, I'm not putting down Robin Hood for people who just want to trade normal stocks and stuff like that. Like, it's very privileged to say, like, you should be trading on a brokerage account because for some people, Robin Hood is their brokerage account. But just be cognizant of these institutions and not so trusting of people like the little guy's going to get fucked before the big guy, you know, just putting it out there. I think investing just to add to that point, like investing in the market, it's a wonderful thing. But like, I think the the sort of the the mission, what Robinhood is saying that they're doing, democratizing trading, it doesn't really, it didn't really appear that way when all <laughs> the like, traders we're shutting got, it uh, down. Yeah, yeah. We're, call, it, we're it, calling Con Edison. We're unplugging it. You're done. Goodbye. Yeah, I feel right, bad for right. those people. Feel bad for guys like Jay Portnoy, but also he played himself by getting out of Bitcoin. Like you guys went over there and taught him, you know, told him what to do, and then he sold and didn't wait either because he's impatient. So sometimes for, people pay get for hands, you know. Yeah, no. Sometimes people hands. get what's coming to them. Dave and I have had our own little thing. He went on his podcast and said we're BFFs, and he was sh- surprised. He loves me, so we're all good. But yeah, no, I love that video when you guys went over to his house and we're trying to show him Bitcoin. What I love most is we're like the fifteen half, you know, iced coffees sitting on the table. <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, he's like, Brr. he had like fifteen jacks. Yeah, I'm just like, this is a lot, and I'm it's just like, kind a of a lot of coffee, and that's strong coffee. Wow. Shout out to Dave Portnoy, but he does have paper hands. We can all agree, Dave Portnoy <laughs> has paper <laughs> hands. He's a good guy. Um, and also with the barstool fund, I know you guys gave to that as well. I feel like he was doing more for small businesses than literally anybody in New York City. Like nobody was caring. Like my so many of my favorite restaurants shut down, understaffed, or just in like ill condition. And for someone who isn't a billionaire to start this fund and do this when he really has no reason to, I just felt like that was really great. And I know you guys gave to that. And so shout out to the Barstool Fund. Yeah, no, it was an awesome effort. I mean, it was crazy because I don't know if you remember in January also like there was the outdoor dining in bubbles. You know, it's like, wait, no one's um, transferring germs in these bubbles. Over on like, it was on like 7th Avenue South, they had all these little bubbles and even at like around like the, around like the gay bars and stuff at duplex and whatever, they would have the little bubbles. And I was like, you know what the fuck is going on in those bubbles? I'm not getting in one of those (laughs) bubbles. Are you kidding me? That's worse. And then they like claim, they claim the person's going in there to clean it, which is like sanitation theater. They're like, all right, next, next party of like 15 in the bubble. No. (laughs) <laughs> no, I, I mean, the, the interesting thing about the whole COVID response is that like, because and I will we've say the that, politicians were having indoor parties and like big birthday yeah, bashes. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. It was do, us. Do, it, like, do as I say, not as I do. And like, I love him. I think he's a handsome guy and whatever. They were just doing all this news with Delta and this and that. I'm like, Obama just had 500 of his closest friends in Martha's Vineyard. I'm like, is Chrissy Teigen one of his closest friends? Like, why, why do I have to sit in my apartment? But I cut you off well, anyway. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, federalism, the having like 50 different state responses to COVID made it really complex. And like, it's very hard to coordinate like a a single response. That being said, the fact that different states like Florida took completely different strategies in Texas will give us so much insight looking back kind of on like what worked, what didn't work. Like, did shelter in place actually make sense? Or should we have just kind of gone about our lives or whatever but I'm, I'm confused there's people who like are just totally knocking florida and trying to like discredit it it's like well if they wanted to go that way let's just see how it plays out and learn from that you know and i don't know how did sweden do like we know here but they didn't lock down but we're not getting these different stories surface it's like there's For all sure. this uh fear well, the, porn the problem and people is also- just <laughs> Yeah, no, ahead, I love beer porn. Uh, my favorite kind. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> besides tentacle, no. Um, I feel like the problem is also our news is so curated these days. Like if I look at certain news, my algorithm is going to give me that news. So it doesn't really matter if you're a liberal, Democrat, whatever, like Republican, conservative. Once you start watching this news, let's say you go on TikTok and you watch COVID videos that are, you know, on one side of an argument, you're just going to get that same news regurgitated. You could turn on CNN right. 
and you'll see a totally different view of the country than if you go on Fox. You get so much different news and it's gonna take an independent person looking back because hindsight is 2020 to see what really worked, what didn't, what was pointless. And I've also noticed so many people are hypocrites. Like I posted the other day and said something like, you know, I don't wear my mask everywhere if I'm on like an empty block, right? Oh, I got dragged. <laughs> like one of my friends was like, you don't wear your mask everywhere. You're killing people, you're this and that. And I was like, I'm fully vaccinated. All my friends are vaccinated. I'm walking down like an empty block in New York, whatever. Two days later, you're at market days in Chicago, a massive rave with like 5,000 people indoors, no masks on. So I'm like, at least practice what you preach some of these people and like don't throw stones when you live in a glass house. I just feel like people are so fake these days. <laughs> I think the hypocrisy was pretty, has been pretty tough to swallow, especially from the, the, the leaders. I mean, you were even saying that it was political theater when they had Vlad in DC. I don't know if that was on Zoom, but I feel like so many of our politicians are trying to be like TikTok stars and like join the Sway House and move to LA. And I'm like, no, you need to govern and get off Twitter. <laughs> like leave Twitter <laughs> to Cameron and Tyler Winkleboss because you guys love to tweet. I don't want to hear my governor on Twitter or my senators like, you go govern and get things done. Yeah, but anyway, right. I digress. <laughs> yeah, I just I just like that you guys are passionate about that. And when you're on CNBC, I think it's just like, because that guy didn't do his homework, you were getting blamed for that. And the people listening to this podcast right now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google like Winklevoss CNBC. And I don't remember the name of the pundit. You guys would probably remember his name. But yeah, he was like, but Tyler... You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, but did you call Vlad? And he was like, no, and why would I call Vlad? And you're like, because that's your job, sir. <laughs> you're like, he was like, I don't, why, how would I get his, you're like, why, what is going on? But DM him on Twitter, you know, DM him or. Vlad whatever. was on fucking Barstool. Vlad is not hard to reach. I'll, I'll get Vlad on here tomorrow. What are you talking about? He's like, what do you mean you can't get a hold of Vlad? Vlad literally lives for this moment and this attention. Something else I want to talk to you guys about going back in time. You competed in the Olympics. You rode in the Olympics in 2008, right? That's right. Yep. In recent years, I feel like there's been way more of an emphasis placed on mental health in the Olympics, like with Naomi Osaka, Simone Biles. Did you guys watch the Olympics this year? How did you feel about them putting their mental health over the competition? We watched it. I think it was like, um, it's an interesting games this year because it was like pushed out a year and athletes are so like we're so geared and fine tuned. So it must have been a really long cycle. I bet some of the athletes by the end of it were just like, I need like a break because out. it's you literally are increasing it 25 percent more. And then I think like there is no spectators. And I feel like there was probably like some people are like, why are we doing this? Should we have it? And there's all this like mixed message and no fans and stuff. So I think it was probably a very challenging environment to begin with on top of what a normal sure. um environment is but um yeah i think that like I, I followed the the mental health stuff a bit and i think with simone biles like it sounded like if you're not in a good headspace you can you can really injure yourself so. and cause bodily harm and mm -hmm. i think when you're in that in that if that's the sort of stakes you're dealing with then you really you know you shouldn't you probably should not be performing and stuff. Sure. It's one thing to like, hey, I'm going to run this race and lose it and I'm not in a good headspace. But it's another thing to sort of do the competition and fall and, you know, maybe like break your neck or something. So I think that might have been lost a little bit in the messaging and people were kind of confused about they're like, oh, OK, um, but that was sort of what I got as a rower. If we have if you're like not at a good mental space, you just go slower. Mm -hmm. Like you, you're not in like physical danger, but there's some sports like uh, mogul seeing at the Olympics. They do multiple flips off those jumps. Mm -hmm. If you mess up, you could break your neck. I mean, there's, exactly. there's, a, there's a snowboarder. I think it's an Olympic female snowboarder, U.S. snowboarder that did come down. I don't know if it was practice. I don't think it was an Olympics, but it came down on on um, on the half pipe and broke her neck and died. So like there are yeah. certain sports. I don't like that at all. Don't tell like, that story. You make mistakes, <laughs> and so I don't know enough about gymnastics. And and, I, and Tyler, I, just to add to that, like the the opening, there's a loser um, uh, in the opening of the Russian Sochi Games who who literally died like on a test run before the game started. So there are sports where 
you can get seriously injured. That's how I felt. I was talking to this guy I know, he's an Olympic swim coach, and he was like, the mental aspect is so much of it. Like, yes, physical, but mental is like, people don't realize even like training and all of that. And you guys can speak to that training, what, 11 months out of the year, 11 and a half months out of the year. And I felt like it was the 2020 Olympics in 2021 weird also no audience at all and i just know as a performer myself if there's no audience i am not gonna go as hard especially not gonna risk dying for a fucking empty <laughs> stadium like i'm not gonna kill myself for an empty auditorium and like the viewership right. and ratings were lower than they'd ever been it's like simone don't kill yourself for this yeah bullshit. and and i think the other thing is like the media built her up so much going in and i think the that pressure. was sort of it it, it puts her in such a tough spot. And then, of course, when she sort of bowed out, the media was making this the biggest story. And mm -hmm. I think it's so hard. You know, she was in such a tough position be because of that. And also, and so, you know, remember, and like, Olympic athletes don't deal with that scrutiny all the time. So if you're like Tom Brady, like, you kind of grow up into that. Oh, you're a doppelganger? All the time. Oh. Thank you, I would. But for Olympians, the world's not paying attention for three over three years. And all of a sudden, the spotlight's on. So you never get a chance to get used to that the way like professional or other athletes do if you're like a baseball player or a basketball player. Right. You're sort of always there and you kind of grow into it and you become used to it probably over, over time. It's not like all or nothing. It's zero to 100 miles an hour. I think that's very difficult to basically be anonymous for most of your life. For like and three all, and a half years. And all and of a then... sudden, overnight, you know, the, the weight of a country is on your shoulders and you have to perform. It's like we talked about with our band. We practice with dress rehearsals and building right. up to the crowds. There's really no practicing for mm -hmm. all of a sudden becoming Michael Phelps in one moment. Um, or the Olympics like in four, every four years. So I think that's like one of the biggest challenges for, for Olympians is that this exposure happens overnight and it happens once every four years. Right, that's what I was talking about with my yeah. friend. I was saying, cause he's a coach, I'm like, no offense. And I mean this with the utmost love and respect. After the Olympics, a lot of these people will go into obscurity for like three years and like 10 months until like we start ramping up for the next Olympics. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So it's like these people aren't used to it. Like they're going to get all their followers and viewers like these few weeks and then we're really not going to hear from them for a yeah. few years. I mean, I can't even imagine the pressure someone like Simone Biles would be under, someone like Naomi Osaka. Also, these are like women of color who are the first, you know, to do some of these things. Or Simone had what, like five different tricks named after her that she invented. Naomi Osaka has so much pressure on her because she's the first. As a world, we just need to practice more empathy. You for know? sure. And sort of give people space. You know, right. So Tyler, you've speaking of mental health, you are in therapy. Cameron, are you in therapy? Or are you just perfect? Uh, I'm perfect. No, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm anything but I am. I am uh, definitely imperfect, definitely human and also uh, do therapy. It's like a coach for anything. There's no such thing as a world class athlete mm -hmm. that doesn't have a coach. It's right. that sort of. Uh, third party, those eyes on you that you just can't see. That's why people do a lot of like video stuff, like in, in training and become an athlete. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like a coach for your brain, which for is sure. like your most important muscle. And right. <laughs> we, everybody talks about their trainer at the gym and like, oh, I do CrossFit or whatever they, whatever their thing is. And they like talk about it and compare notes. But that's for your body, right? Which is important. But like, what about the coach for your brain? You know, and so um, it's it's sort of that personal growth thing and just expanding as a person, right? In all those ways. And we all have traumas, right? There's no one who grows up that, you know, doesn't have things that are trying to work through. You know, your parents, your family unit gives you a lot of good things, hopefully, but there's probably some not so good things that you have to unlearn and, and, and figure sure. out. So. It's really like, to me, it's all about like optimizing growth mm -hmm. and actualizing as a person. And that could be your relationships, that could be your anxiety, the way you mm -hmm. look at the world, your happiness. And sort of like one of the things that, um, you know, we've been fortunate to do is, is have success financially and business-wise. Mm -hmm. And when you do that though, there's, there's been days where I've woken up and, um, you know, my bank account's a lot bigger because of Bitcoin going up. 
but I wasn't that I wasn't like five times happier. Right. That's happier. And so you climb that mountain. And I, I think a lot of people, this is their story. Um, as entrepreneurs, you climb that mountain, you, you make all these riches and success and you realize it only solved your money problems. And then you've got to figure out like other ways to grow, um, and, and, and live a richer, fuller life, uh, from an experience. And you realize like, Hey, like I've got these great things, but like, I feel like I'm missing other things there. So I think of it just like a trainer for, for your brain. And there's so many other like ways to attack it, right? Like, Mm. Meditation, obviously, working out is good. Like um, executive coaching, like mm. people call it life coaching. There's so many different ways. But like, look, I mean, even as as musicians, you you have a teacher, you have coaches, mm. and so it's just another area of life for for that kind of growth. Right. It's like I always say, mo money, mo problems. Like just because you have yeah. money doesn't mean your problems went away. And it's something I put in my notes. What's interesting is so much of your story and what people know about you and the perception of who the Winklevoss twins are, the Winklevi are, has been told by other people, either in like a box office film or an expose or this or that. But you guys haven't really had a chance to tell your own story from your yeah. own perspective. And in researching you guys, I feel like, and I put in my notes, I said, I don't feel like your net worth correlates to your self-worth. Like, I don't feel like y'all's, your self-worth is contingent or dependent upon your net worth. You seem like you just care about building things and those things have happened to accrue and make you rich. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we're like builders at heart. Mm -hmm. We just really enjoy doing that. And we happen to like express that through a startup and, and right now that's Gemini. Right. Um, and it might be something else in the future. And like the, the band is kind of a startup. Um, you For know, sure. we're just sort of building this this thing. Um, and that is like really a fun place for us to, to be and exist in. Um, but I think that like, um, yeah, like in, in 2017, it was interesting because like it was sort of the first like massive crypto bull run. And mm -hmm. I remember in like a, a, a period of like two or three months, I think Bitcoin went up like 20 X. Right. I remember like being so busy and so stressed. And it was just like the world is <laughs> moving a thousand miles an hour. And I'm being like, I am not 20 times happier. I might be exactly. like actually less happier and like in, in a worse, a worse sort of spot. And I sort of um, stepped well, back. Well, if, like, if you need to unload some of that burden, yeah, yeah. My, okay. my, my Gemini account is open. Yeah. So, you know, hit, yeah. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Go on, go but on. I think, <laughs> I think like a lot of times um, people like, we sort of all lie to ourselves on one level that like, if we achieve this or, or get to this point, like that'll solve everything. So, okay, if I, if I get into Harvard, mm -hmm. my problems are solved. Okay, now I'm in Harvard. If I win a national championship, that'll solve it. Right. Okay. No. Um, if I become an Olympian, that's going to do it. Okay. Right. Well, I did that. And, and now I've sort of, I don't know really what to do and that didn't really do it. So maybe I'm going to go like start a company. We're, we're sort of, uh, telling these stories. And a lot of times people kind of figure this out really late. Like you figure it out when you're 65 or seven, you're like, wait mm -hmm. a second, I made partner at the law firm. I, I sort of hit all these, you know, professional goals and past all these checkpoints, but like, I'm not happily married or I've been kind of a shitty spouse or I haven't been a great, right. a great father or whatever. And you come to that realization, but it's sort of, it's a later, it doesn't mean you obviously can't, you know, change or, or, or um, does it make sense to like go on a journey at that point? But mm -hmm. I think that like the sooner you kind of figure out and you detach achievement or like goalposts and the things that you're trying to do, from happiness, then you can get on that path of like, oh, wait a second, where's the personal growth? And how do I actually find that true, like sense? And how do I address some of the trauma or things that I've experienced? And I think, like, the the, the book that that I started with was the body keeps the score. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like a really great kind of uh, starting point. And they're sort of like, when uh, the word trauma, I used to always think like, oh, that's a car crash or something really like catastrophic. But there's mm -hmm. also like trauma little T's and all these things that build up over over your childhood or over, you know, your your lifespan. And and I think pretty much if you're human, you have them <laughs> on sure. some level. And uh, and and so I think therapy is like a way to sort of, you know, address some of that and 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 think through problems that 
in like a safe space that you might not otherwise have for whatever reason based on, you know, whatever's going on in your life. And it's like a, a sounding board. Um, and I think that um, I found that like the more you grow personally, the more you go professionally mm-hmm. and it's sort of counterintuitive. Like you, I think there's a lot of people who would get a lot further professionally if that's your goal, if they sort of, come at it from a personal growth standpoint, I think it's way more powerful. And that's kind of what I see generally. It's like, we're often like holding ourselves back and it's nothing to do with sort of our work environment or whatever. It has to do with, you know, not addressing kind of your own stuff. Yeah. And I feel like also it's great for you guys because your therapist probably does not care that you're like on the cover of Forbes or that you invented Facebook. Like they, your therapist doesn't give a shit about any of those things. He's just going to give it to you straight, no chaser and tell you like, here's what I think would help you. Did you guys have conversations growing up about mental health? It's become so much more of a conversation, but were you guys really close with your parents? I know you kind of have a German background. You guys, your family's from Germany, immigrated, came up from nothing, which I think a lot of people don't know. But did you guys have these conversations about mental health with your parents as athletes who were teenagers and who were probably performing really well academically? So sport kind of helps you think through, like you you build sort of a a mental toughness and a goal Mm -hmm. setting and an ability to kind of um, basically, you know, I guess I guess I'd call it sort of a, a mental toughness but it's sort of this thing where it makes you really strong and you learn how to like work hard and deal with pain and all this stuff um but that's actually not necessarily a healthy path forward and once you leave sport um you don't want to push through necessarily days where you feel like uh like shit and you feel Mm -hmm. sick it's it's actually not what you want to do and you don't want to work harder and to the grindstone so i think like Sport teaches you a lot, but sometimes like later on, you have to detrain some of the things that made you a good athlete and, and the things that were saying, like, don't, don't, don't listen to your feeling, right? Like stuff mm-hmm. that, right. You, you feel a little, um, overtrained. You've got an injury work through that. Right. It's kind of giving you that message a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, and I think like, at least for me personally, I've had to detrain a little bit of that thinking. Sort of to answer a little bit of the other half of the question is that we're a super close tight family. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, this is an, this is kind of a generational thing. Like we didn't have Mm -hmm. conversations, um, in sort of knowledge. Um, and so we've sort of like shared our journeys with them and brought them into the fold. But, you know, our parents are. Um, you know, they're boomers, right? They're, mm. they're 78 and the, a lot of the, Oh my God, my, my dad is 78, but I'm 23. So <laughs> that's the difference. Um, he was 55 of, when I was born. <laughs> so I can this, relate. Yeah. A lot of this science is, is quite new yeah, uh, and it's quite evolved and especially, um, maybe it's been, I, th- I think a lot of it was really pioneered post Vietnam, like the mainstreaming of it and like books like the body keeps the score. Mm-hmm. It's fairly, it's fairly new. And, and when I say like even mainstreaming, I mean like in, in cities, right. I don't right. know what the penetration is and understanding is like outside of coastal cities. I hope it's a lot. Um, but you know, these topics are, are pretty new. So I, you know, they, they kind of, we're now, we're now almost, we're turning 40 um on saturday oh uh, my god really so, so are you guys you guys are are you guys leos that makes a lot we are, of sense we are leos. Yeah. So our, our childhood um i, I gotta go <laughs> you're both leos i'm scared it predates, <laughs> it predates a lot of this stuff so um it's been it's been fascinating to turn a to learn about it um especially later in life it's sort of For sure got into my journey only a few years ago and it's an eye opener. It's like, what else don't I know about myself in the world around me? So it's kind of humbling. Um, but it's, but it's been amazing at the same time. Would you ever date a girl who wasn't in therapy? Like for a girl to date you, does she have to also be in therapy or is that not a prerequisite? That is not a prerequisite. Okay. Okay. We got a lot of questions. I, I, uh, I saw this tweet. I don't know who wrote it, but it said, uh, the person asked the question, they're like, are you a funny person or did you have a good childhood? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like sometimes people with like trauma are the most interesting, right? Cause they've built up right. a resilience and like superhuman powers to get around certain things. And, uh, uh, so it's a funny, que- it's an interesting question. 
Yeah, I was out the other night with someone and he was like, well, you're so confident and funny because you probably weren't ever bullied or you were never oppressed as a kid. And I'm like, the only gay kid at an all boys private school in Texas? You think I wasn't bullied, beat up, harassed, threatened? Like, are you kidding me? My front two teeth are fake. My nose has been broken. Like, are you kidding me? I was like, I had to fight to be confident. You know what I'm saying? And like fight for myself. You built like an armor and a survival strategy that for can sure. serve, you, serve you well uh, on some level. And, but it's like, you're saying the body keeps score. It's like, for anybody listening to this podcast, it's going to catch up with you. So you should go ahead and face it now before it's so deep and so, you know, deep rooted in you. Face your issues now. And maybe not during COVID, actually. Maybe wait till COVID passes because you're already isolated enough. And then deal with your issues because it's going to catch up to you at some point. Yeah. And, and, and the, what that means, like the body keeps the score, is like your body sort of has a memory of all these things, even if it's not up in your mind. Right. And, and I think that like, um, to your point, it, it sort of has this memory and, and eventually you can't just like outrun your past. You, at some sure. point you're going to have to like confront it and, and sort of work through that stuff. And that really, I think almost goes for everybody. And do for it sure. now before you make really big decisions in your life that you mm -hmm. made, would have made differently if you had grown more in this way, like before you pick your career path, your yeah. spouse, like, right. Or you raise kids, like heal yourself, make yourself right. the best version of you. So when you make these big lifelong decisions with consequences, mm -hmm. like, you're in the best spot possible. For sure. I feel that way all the time with even some of my friends. One of my friends, he's like in his mid thirties and he would treat people like absolute shit. And then when people would call him on it, he'd be like, but my mom passed away when I was 10. And I'm like, we're so empathetic to that. But at a certain point you have to heal and do the work. Like you can't right. just be a shit to everybody and then blame it on this trauma. You got to grow up and evolve. <laughs> you got to do the work. Right, right. You're, you're like blaming being a dick on shit that happened 25 years ago and you need to do the work and you have the resources and your privilege and <laughs> Enough to have it, which not a lot of people, not everyone has. Yeah, well, look, it's, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility, you know. For sure. It's like, deal with your side of the street, please. <laughs> um, okay, so going back, I want to go back a little bit and talk to you guys about when you were going through everything with Facebook, because we got to talk a little bit. I got so many questions about Facebook on my DMs, and I was like, I'm so tired of hearing about this. I couldn't imagine. I just graduated college. I couldn't imagine every interview or every time I talk to someone or go somewhere, people are asking me about someone I went to college with 15 years prior. I'm like, I don't care. And I saw an interview you guys did at the 92nd Street Y with Ben Meserich, who did Bitcoin billionaires. And I feel like Ben is always, and we love Ben Meserick, he's an incredible author. He's always pushing this narrative that you guys are in this like constant war with Mark Zuckerberg, this constant push and pull and struggle. And you wake up thinking about him. And I'm like, I really don't think that's the case at all. It makes for a good story, Ben Meserick, but I'm like, I really don't think you guys care. You're over it. Ben's a good storyteller and it makes for, you know, it's very theatrical, right. the whole, the whole uh, dynamic. But the, the, to, I think to your point, like this was literally, it was 15 years ago. Um, it was a point in time we had our sort of disagreement. Um, there was a social network. But sort of life, life has moved on and we're, we're you know, on to much different stuff. And yeah, there, we just don't really have a lot of bandwidth to sort of yeah, it's like, I don't the wake past up. or care about it. Like it's sort of, I, I'm so much more, like I'm so excited, like looking forward and about the yeah. future. And, and I just don't have time to really think about it, you know? Yeah, that's why I'm like, the windshield is so much bigger than the rear view mirror, like, move forward. I just thought it was funny, he kept going with this narrative, he's like, you guys wake up and you're mad, and I was like, I guarantee you, they're good. <laughs> I was like, they're chilling, I don't think they're stressed, I'm like, who wants, who's even using Facebook anymore? My mom uses Facebook. The only thing I get from Facebook are memories from shit I posted in middle school. And I'm like, I don't ever want to see what I was writing on my wall like yeah. 10 years ago at all. So I'm like, I got to get off there. So I want to play a rapid fire game and then I'm going to let you guys get out of here because I got so many DMs from people. I didn't know people were going to be so energized and passionate, but when I posted on my story, I said, send in questions. I got so many questions and I would say 
10% of them were intelligent Bitcoin questions. 90% I can't even read. Like the first question was, Cameron and Tyler, will you please fuck me? That was the first question. The <laughs> second question was, ask the Winklevoss twins, can I be the middle spoon? And I was just like, okay, I'm done. I'm putting my phone in a bottle of Purell. I'm not reading this. Um, but some people had questions about if Ether could really scale due to the gas fees. So you guys would maybe understand what they're getting at with these fees and everything with Ether. They're like, is Ether really going to be competitive against the alternatives when there are these fees? So I think the short answer is Ether is shifting to proof of stake, which is a different consensus uh, mm -hmm. mechanism. And I think that's going to really increase the, the transaction throughput, the scale, and decrease the costs and the gas fees. So it's making uh, strides in that direction. And I, I think the short answer is yes. Like I, we're very bullish on Ether. It's got a Same. huge community, <laughs> great developers behind it. They're gonna figure it out. <laughs> I'm still doing your PR, so okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another question we had was, what are the thoughts on the pending US regulations on crypto exchanges? So I guess they mean the infrastructure bill and I, I mean, I use the word infrastructure loosely because I feel like that bill had everything in the kitchen sink in it. So what are your thoughts? I know you were very passionate about the infrastructure bill. This was last week or the week before. Yeah. So basically, there's language in the infrastructure bill around crypto tax reporting, mm -hmm. um, which makes a lot of sense. Right. Uh, if you if you buy crypto and, and you make money, you should pay your your fair share of taxes. The problem was. The language was capturing all these different types of businesses, including like software developers mm -hmm. um, and creating sort of obligations um, that they couldn't possibly meet, nor should they meet. And so we were working, the community was working with a few senators to try and build an amendment to address the, the language and, and create like more clarity around it. And ultimately the amendment was killed by an 87-year-old senator in Alabama who wanted $50 billion more for defense spending, didn't get it, and They're so decided, They're coming to take his hey, guns, though. <laughs> we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna scuttle this, this, uh, this amendment, which, which actually is like win-win for everybody because it gives like good reporting requirements, so crypto pays their tax, and the people behind infrastructure get the money they want, and right. it keeps innovation on shore instead of people saying, whoa, this is crazy language. It doesn't make sense. Draconian. I can't I can't meet these requirements. I'm going to move offshore and start building, you know, my business over there, which is bad for America and bad for tax revenue overall. Right. This was win win for, for tax revenue and win win for innovation, which begets more tax revenue. And so. It was like really kind of dis it, in one way, it was it was amazing to see the crypto community come together sure. um, on this issue. Very disappointing that someone who probably doesn't understand like crypto and, and again, do we need more defense spending? We're already running like a trillion dollar. I think we're already spending a trillion dollars on. And it's all like no one wants to come here. Like, <laughs> like we're, we're, we don't we're, need it. And, and we're spending it on weapons for yesterday's war. Um, right. I mean, it's not like and, and the infrastructure bill, by the way, I think only like six billion dollars is going towards uh, electric vehicle chargers. So you can mm -hmm. say, OK, that's infrastructure for the future. But the rest of it's like, you know, the infrastructure <laughs> portion is like bridges and roads and all the like basically repairing old ass infrastructure, like old right. world 20th century infrastructure. It's like putting paint on all of this stuff. It's not right. actually saying, hey, let's go like give the boring company or Elon like, you know, $50 billion to build like tunnels and high speed rail and actually for the future. This is uh, like I would love um, high speed rail. I would putting really band-aids on on the past. So anyway, I'm I'm digressing I, I don't even know where the first No, part of the go question off. Is, As like, the kids would say, go off. But Cameron. like um <laughs> this is this is you know it's not an infrastructure bill. Um, it, That's what I was incredible. saying. The word infrastructure is being used very loosely. Have you guys considered it, going to the Hill? I've been to the Hill a few times. Maybe some FaceTime with these dudes and some checks will get your things passed and what you want. Have you considered so going up there? We're definitely like, you know, our, we're, we, we've always sort of been engaged with key stakeholders and we're definitely going to continue to engage because like there's mm -hmm. definitely people who, who believe in crypto and the innovation. Sure. And I think it's important to always have those dialogues. 
but sort of how this all went down was a bit disappointing um, on some level um, when there was such an obvious like win-win pass. I think we're ultimately going to get to a good place because I think um, even if the original language stays in there, judges can interpret it. The IRS can sort of interpret it as well and create guidance around it. So I don't think all is lost. But I do think it sort of exposes that like government like leaves a, a lot to like be desired. And that's why we're so, so kind of excited about Bitcoin and decentralized yeah. money and decentralized protocol because it's sort of like built into the code and it's permissionless and you're not um, subject to the whims of humans. And, you know, the, the, the Fed, um, Federal Reserve is like a board of 12 people that meet behind closed doors and then publish their minutes later. And you're kind of you're not in that room. There is no. Yeah, I think some were published baseball. today, or something new was published today. Yeah, the and, reserve or something. There is no, I don't keep up with all that. I mean, I do, but there, who cares? There's, <laughs> there's no room in Bitcoin. It's all open source code, and and I think that like this is the same government. We just watched Saigon 2.0. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been in Afghanistan for 21 years, and we couldn't figure out a way to like orderly exit in a graceful manner to sort of like protect the people that work with us and whatever. Like we literally had 20 years to figure that out. And here we are at Saigon 2.0. And I (laughs) tweeted about this yesterday. I'm like, this is the same government that you trust to manage your money. Right. Think again. Think again. Even people, I was like going through before this earlier this morning, even people who don't like you, they were like, Cameron, I agree with you. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. They're like, like, I I think you're a piece of shit, but I agree with you on this. Okay. (laughs) They're like, I hate you. Most of your content sucks when it comes into my feed, but this I really agree with. We can't even get into Afghanistan, the Taliban. And I guarantee you, my listeners watch Real Housewives and the Kardashians. We're not talking about the Taliban in Afghanistan. (laughs) We need them to go get on Gemini and download and put some money in. But you also brought up a good point with the money printing because the money printer literally just going like the money printer won't stop it keeps going okay someone said are nfts just traditional money laundering with more steps no (laughs) no i don't think so either and also it's like you know what they do with the u.s dollar someone said okay if a girl brings up the social network on a first date is that a deal breaker no not necessarily not really Okay, if she says she doesn't believe in crypto, is that a deal breaker? Probably. Probably. (laughs) Like, doesn't understand is different than... Yes, you can educate. Yes, okay. Yeah, there's plenty of people like, I don't get it or whatever. It's not my thing. But like, if someone like, doesn't believe in it, and they know from the work, that's probably a deal (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's like that's like not believing in the future. It's like I don't like believe in the internet. This. Like meeting someone in right. ninety five and being like, I don't believe in the internet thing. Okay. Yeah, and you guys Probably are going that. to you guys want to move to Mars anyway. What's going on with this? So you guys are really obviously passionate about Mars, and you guys purchased to go with Richard Branson to space. When is this happening? So we got tickets uh, probably five five years ago. Um, I think we're astronaut like 700 and 701 or something so i'm not exactly sure hold your breath for that uh but we'll see it i guess i guess now with the the initial flight it's on the horizon at some point yeah all i could just keep thinking about when jeff bezos was up i was like that literally looks like a dildo like you just launched the first dildo into space like that looks ridiculous but shout out to shout out to them okay next question if a girl says her ex-boyfriend is dave portnoy is that a deal breaker no. <laughs> no. Nah. You're like, okay, so good. He's a good talent scout. Okay. Have yeah. you guys ever been have you ever been out and had twins come up to you and try to like proposition you at the same time? Like I'm sure girls who are twins come up to you, but maybe you're not out that much. I don't think that's happened. It's a yeah. good question, really? I don't think it has. Yeah. Oh my god, twins don't come many, up to you? I don't meet that many girls that are twins or at least identical twins together. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, someone said, what's the most extravagant gift you've bought a girl? I'm guessing like a handbag or a trip. <clears throat> what's the most extravagant, expensive gift you've bought someone you're dating? Mm. I don't think I've... Nothing too, nothing too extravagant. Nothing too extravagant? Think... <laughs> <laughs> I've given my time. 
<laughs> okay. Someone else said, what's the biggest splurge you've made for yourselves? Probably real estate. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a home a splurge. Like an investment though. Yeah, that's true. When I Googled you guys, the house in LA, the fuck pad looks really nice. All the glass and the pool. <laughs> great house. Okay. Someone wanted to know, would you rather be stuck in an elevator with Mark Zuckerberg or Joe Biden? For how long? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I honestly, I feel like if there were three billionaires in the elevator, they'd be getting you guys out real quick. So it probably wouldn't be too long. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's been great chatting with you guys. I know you usually talk to like Forbes, Vanity Fair, Fortune, and now you're talking to me. So you need to go fire your entire team. But it's been great. And I think people are going to love hearing from you. There's so much about you I think people don't see because they get little vignettes. And I just hope you guys start to show people more of who you are. So I know you're on Twitter. You're kind of, I feel like you guys tolerate Instagram, but you're not super into Instagram. You guys love Twitter. You're not on TikTok. Mm -hmm. I feel like you'd rather join ISIS than get on TikTok. You're not into it. You're not trying to do the dances. I want people to find you on Twitter. I want people to go download Gemini, put some money into it, learn about crypto. Like if it's for me, it's literally for you. And uh, Mars Junction, at Mars Junction on Instagram. That's yes. our new, uh, <laughs> new account. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you guys so much. We'll have to, I want to come by the Gemini offices at some time when you're back in the office or when you're in the office and harass you and see the culture. I want one of the Rage Against the Machine shirts. Mm -hmm. Whenever I step in somewhere, productivity just increases. So thank you guys so much. Thanks. And this was great. Have a good day. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks. See you. See you.